ground away from the water tank to where you end up with a tank up on a pedestal that no one can reach. So we put uh, all of our tanks, we put on a raised mound. Um, this, this is a 40 foot by 40 foot water block here. And we want that, that raised mound to be a minimum of about 12 inches above the, the finish height of it, be about 12 inches above ground level. And we want a minimum of 15 feet of protected area from the edge of the tank uh, out. And that goes back to when you have one animal standing there drinking, two passing by each other uh, behind them. We always put down a geotextile map. This is going to make, particularly in a wet climate like this, it's going to make your uh, uh, your gravel, whatever you put there to create the mound, to make it solid. If you put down the geotextile mat, it'll make that last a lot longer. You're going to have to replace it less frequently. Um, <coughs> we're just going to make the site more durable. Whether you use the, the mesh stuff or the the woven, you know, I don't know, I don't care, whatever you can find, you know, that's the most affordable in your area. Uh, in our experience, we, we've used thin mat, thick mat, woven meshes, and they've all performed about the same. So to me, it really is a cost factor and availability. Then uh, we're going to put four to six inches of aggregate on top of it, a uh, line screen. Some people will you know, put down a base layer of larger rock and then cap it with lime screenings or something, which will make a, uh, a pretty smooth, solid, very durable surface. Once again, whatever you have available in your area is what you what you use. Uh, where we are, uh, the valley where we live is extremely rocky. They don't call it the Rocky Mountains for nothing. We got a lot of rock, so all we do, if you just go out the irrigated area, you know, with the backhoe, and just scoop up what's ever there because there's going to be plenty of rocks in it. The downside of that is, you know, we have some half bushel basket, basketball sized rocks, you know, around some of the tanks. They get rolled away eventually, but uh, again, here down in the Ozarks, uh, you got a lot of opportunity to, you don't have to get pretty white rock. You know, you can get it out of the hillside or something and it'll do the job. Uh, different types available. Our personal preference is tire tanks. A lot of that has to do just with the durability of it. It's hard to break a tire tank. I've seen a lot of situations with steel tanks, fiberglass tanks, plastic tanks, where someone <clears throat> doing a little maintenance work, painting the rock, you know, has swung the blade into the side of your tank. You do that with a tire tank, basically the tractor bounces off of it. You do that with a concrete tank, steel tank, fiberglass tank, and you just got a hole and gouge in it. Uh, tire tanks are very durable. There are some places you can uh, get them relatively low cost. I know PowerFlex um, sells tire tanks out here, so I'm not going to say that uh, you can get them for free, but a few scrounders still occasionally find tire tanks, tires for free. Um, Versus what? Okay, what, what's the water quality difference between tire tank, concrete, metal, plastic? Uh, it's essentially the same. The the hydrocarbons, the, the tires are pretty well in there. There's been uh, several studies done looking at the uh, if you're getting uh, any chemical compounds out of the tire. What you what you can get initially, uh, there might be like road oil uh, that is in the water uh, initially, but it disappears fairly quickly. In the long term, uh, there's no difference in the, the water. And some of the studies, what was originally done in West Virginia, uh, the first tire tanks were in mining country in West Virginia. They were done in the 70s. And some of these questions came up a long time ago. And I know I saw one study from West Virginia where they uh, took water samples out of the springs that were supplying the tanks and out of the tanks themselves, and there's no difference in the water that was in the tank versus what it was at the source. So we feel pretty good about um, that you're not getting anything negative from the tide. 
So the, the, there are different. Yes, ma'am. What about calves trying to drink out of something that point? What about calves trying to drink out of those? Um, now, this one here, you can see from the, the, the dirt around, it's a new installation. We're usually, you know, have the dirt mounted up to that tire some, and you just figure, and you'll, you'll notice that we have the water level set pretty high. Uh, we generally keep uh, water level set high, partially for that reason. If you're mounted up here, you just need to figure out how much clearance do you have to have for a calf to be able to drink. Uh, let me back up. This one right here, yeah. Uh, this tire, in, in my opinion, this tire should have been cut way back here. Uh, this one, without a mount, I can see that being a real problem uh, for cats to, to be able to get a drink. And the water level is not set particularly high here. So, you know, that, that's just part of that management detail that uh, you need to make sure. And um, I haven't been out to, I'll get you in just a moment now. Uh, I haven't been out to actually look at the tanks that they have here, but I'm assuming that they're cut about like these ones. Has anybody looked? Are they are they cut back this close? Yeah. Okay, yeah, okay. This, this is the way you want it. Yes, ma'am. Is there anybody who's modifying those for goats? Anybody who's modifying those for goats? Yeah, because I'm, I'm foreseeing kids jumping into it at the end of it. Okay. Um, one, I've got, I don't have them in this presentation, okay. but you can, uh, w one nice thing about tire tanks is you can lag bolt, great, you know, any kind of protection you want. You can put, uh, you know, steel uh, mesh grates just big enough so that whatever, you know, if you have cows and uh, goats and sheep all together, you got to have a big enough opening so that a cow can, you know, get her muscle through the drain. And if you keep that at just that size, it's going to be very difficult for kids or lambs to, to get in there. But yeah, kids will jump up on, and this is probably what you're saying, they'll jump up on the edge and run around the edge here and then they fall in when they're playing. Yeah. So if, if, you're, do, if you're doing any kind of an open tank, really any kind of an open tank, um, you, you, when it comes to goats, you might want to put some protection on there. But I, you know, I, I've seen the, the square brakes put on, just boards run across, pipe run across, and again, the thing about tire tanks is you can lag bolt them into the the sidewall of the tire and they'll do good. Yeah. All right. The, the comment was you can you can put rocks. Use a lower tire. Absolutely, you can do that. Uh, you can put rocks in the bottom. Uh, the only th concern I would have with rocks in the bottom is that's displacing capacity. So you need to make sure that if you're going to do something like that, when you're figuring your capacity in there, that you account for it. But you, but you can certainly do it. Um, you know, let me back up to this picture. This is out in the west, uh, up on the Forest Service and the BLM, the public grazing allotments. This would be a real common type of tank. You can't see it in this picture. But there is a ramp. That's the under the board across here. You can just see the end of it. That's a ramp. All of these tanks have ramps in them, so that if uh, small animals, birds, whatever, get in it, that they can take that ramp and get out of the tank. Uh, that's one of the certainly in the the, the ranger district that we're in. That's one of the requirements. Any spring development, any stock tank on public land has to have that exit uh, for small animals, wild animals get in. And you can do the same thing, you know, in, in the goat situation is you just put a ramp in it so that if they get in, they can do, 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 climb out of it. Yeah. How, how do you hold the, the bottom end of that in? Uh, usually a rock. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, they, some, there are some tanks that are manufactured now 
that you know have a steel ramp built right into them, and it's it's just because the market, the public lands grazing market says you have to have this. So there's that that particular green tank. I think if you if you were to go to our you know farm and home store these days to buy a tank like that, it would have a built-in steel grate to, as an exit ramp. Are all these watering systems you're showing out of wells or any of them out of ponds being pumped to, to the tank? Okay, uh, what's the source of water? On our farm in North Missouri, we pumped everything out of ponds. And out of, on the research station, we pumped everything out of ponds. Most stock water in North Missouri is out of ponds. And so a lot of uh, ponds have pumps in them. What we did for pumps and ponds is we floated a submersible pump on the underside of an inflated tire. Uh, if you uh, take, take like a you know a truck tire and um, through you know you still have the wheel there, uh, you can make a bracket that will use your lug holes, your wheel, your lug bolt holes. Uh, suspend it down. Typically, we'd be about three feet, three to four feet, because you're down to cooler water there. Not as much of the surface weed or algae problem. Uh, the tire anchored to your bank, bank by a cable, so it stays in one position. And a submersible pump on that, and then your line coming out. Typically, to a, a very in later years, just a very pressure tank. We used to have pump houses. But we went to the pressure tanks that you just bury, and then it goes to the. So this electric flow is using anything a solar pump. Are you, 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 you do, yeah. We did not use we at, at the research station. We have one mobile um, solar pumping unit that we could take pond to pond and set a tank out. Uh, we did not use uh, solar that much because when I was there, um, which been gone since '03 from the research station for seven years, but you know, 15, 20 years ago, solar livestock pumping was not that cost effective. Real small systems for just doing like 40 cows were affordable, and if you were watering 500 or more cows, it was affordable. In between, it wasn't. Uh, nowadays, with the, the better panels, the better pump technology, and if you, you know, talk to Barb Jackson, from Sundog Solar, if you're really interested in. I mean, it just astounds me in the last even five years, five to seven years, the changes that have been made in livestock watering systems with solar. It's you know pretty well affordable now, and it, it's a good way to go if you're if you, if you have multiple ponds and you don't want to water livestock directly out of the ponds, and you're going to you know have paddocks well, come in. My deal is with electric. You don't have electric. I mean, to run the wire to from a pole to where your your pond is, you don't have the cost of either the wire, or you don't have the cost of buying a solar pump. And where, where's that happy medium? You say, where, where what what's better for me? Well, you know, that happy medium of can you afford to run power lines out to your well varies tremendously. Just as an example, um, the rural cooperative that we were. Um, part of in North Missouri there, uh, they would run up to three poles at no charge to, and, you know, all you did is you, if, if they had to run up to three poles to get out to your pond, the only thing you got charged for was the meter, the basic meter charge. Well, that's tremendous. Right across the road was the, uh, the co-op from uh, Chillicothe, from uh, Livingston County, Missouri, and they were something like $600 a pole. So the same setup across, and again, this was 15 plus years ago, the same setup on the other side of the road would have cost $1,800 more than on this side of the road because of the difference in policy in rural co-ops. So it's very, very difficult to answer your question without finding the actual prices. But the thing to think about is, is there any reason to believe that electricity is going to get cheaper? Probably not. As you can move yourself off the grid with some of these applications, your your pumping, lights and power in your barns, whatever, if you can move away from the grid, go to solar power, in the long term I think it's going to, it's going to pay off. And part of that is because the technology each year is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. 
Okay. What, what time is it, by the way? 10.30.